Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. On Wednesday, I started a series called um, Pin It, Pray It, Pursue It. And uh, if you weren't here Wednesday night, please, 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 I, I ask you to go listen to the message because I gave very simple, practical steps on how to prepare yourself for 2019. Um, there's nothing worse than to enter the new year doing the same thing you did the last year. And I really believe that God wants to expand us, increase us. God wants to uh, uh, push us forward. But if, if you think that just because the clock moves forward, that all things are new. I think, I think that we can miss the mark if we think that. Our life is not determined by the movement of a, of a, of a time or a year. Um, the, the movement of our mind determines what we will accomplish in this life. It's not a moving of time that we're looking forward to. It's the movement of renewing our mind. And, and some of us already have, you know, uh, a current attitude, a current perspective, a, a current view uh, uh, of how you see life and, and, and how you view your own life, how you view God. And, and God's saying, hey, uh, let's, let's improve that in 2019. God wants to increase that. And on Wednesday night, um, I said there's three types of people, and I want to remind us, because if you, if you don't get this, you'll leave, and you'll be like, I, I wish I would have heard this, so I want to bring this back up. Three kinds of people in this life. Number one are those who make things happen. Everybody say, make things happen. Make things happen. Number two are those who watch things happen. You just watch everybody else progress, and then you just stay behind. And then there's the third one, and those who wonder, what happened? Go like this with me. Ready? One, two, three. What happened? What the heck? I'm 50 now. Good Lord, what happened? It's like a blink of an eye. I remember when I was 20. What happened? And I'll tell you what happened. What happened was that we, we weren't bringing God into the picture from the beginning. And if you bring God into the picture, if you bring God into the equation, I promise you that he's always going to add to your life. And, um, and, and I, I love it. I was um, talking to Katrina, and I heard her story. In January of 2018, we did uh, this whole miracle, pin it and, and, and pray it and believe for it. And I told people, listen, write something down that's beyond your capacity, beyond your, your talent, your gifts. Write something that's just so out there that people would think you're crazy. And she started writing down three things. And the three things she wrote, she crossed out three different times because she said, there's no way, it's impossible. And the first one was, I want to, you know, work from home and, and, and do everything from home. And for the company she was working for, it just was impossible. The second one was that her son would be involved in church and do something. And then the other one was her daughter to love Jesus. And she's like, impossible. It's so easy to look at your current circumstance and just say, that's, that's just never going to happen. Well, three times she scratched it off. And then she, she finally heard the message that we did as we prepared. I said, listen, if, if it's in your capacity to do it's not from God. If it's beyond your capacity, if it's bigger than you, now you heard from heaven. So she wrote all three down and she slapped it on. Well, guess what? Um, this year, she's working from home. Uh, her son is one of our core leaders of our youth ministry. And her daughter loves Jesus so much that she's one of our teachers in our children's ministry. Don't ever underestimate what God can do in your life. Never, never, never. True story. Do you guys see this piano? It's an upright piano. Pretty cool. I remember my sister called me. She's like, hey, Mauricio, because she knows my daughter plays piano. And she's like, hey, um, there's this piano here that somebody just dumped. And, and they left it here in the apartment building. You know, does Alexis want a piano? I'm like, heck, yeah. I'm like, it's free 99. Yeah. <laughs> so I went and I checked out. I'm like, oh, my God, it's beautiful. At first, it, you know, I mean, I've cleaned it up. But it was all jacked up, messed up, ugly and everything. And how many know that, that put it in the, in the hands of the right person and you can blow it up and do something amazing, right? Well, guess what? Little did the people know who dumped it, this thing is worth $25,000. It's 110 years old. Why do I say that? Don't underestimate where you've been in 2018. 
God can take trash and do something amazing with it. God can take a broken life and do something whole with it. God can take the most messed up family, the most messed up person, and do something creative with it. Are you hearing me today? Man, so get ready. Um, we, we're talking about a vision board for 2019. What's a vision board? A vision board is simply you being intentional in believing God to do something to create a picture of a preferred future. And so what we asked our, our church on Wednesday night, I said, hey, listen, you all have to prepare. You, you have to put something before you. You have to believe God for something. So we did this with our staff, and I told my staff, I'm like, you all have to do a vision board. It's not an option. If you're going to work at LV Church, you got to do this, but it's not just for LV Church. I want them to believe something uh, special from God for their personal life, not just ministry life. And so all the staff did their vision board. This is one of our staff members, and um, it's Felicia. And one of the things that she wants to accomplish in 2019 is she wants to put out her first album. And uh, she's going to go for it. She's going to rock it out. It's going to be amazing. But, but let me tell you something. You know what? People that make things happen clear things. They, they, they do things with clarity. They clear things up. It's not just about putting a picture and just be like, Lord, make it happen. No, it's clarify it. It's, it's uh, define it. And so what we had our staff do is for every single uh, uh, thing, the 10 we said on Wednesday, just, just write the top 10 things you want to accomplish in 2019. You know, because if you start putting 15, 30, you know you're not going to do it. Come on. You know, we can barely lose five pounds. Come on. Let's, let's be real. So I said, just the top 10 things that you'll accomplish in 2019. And I said, then you put an illustrated picture that, or a picture that will illustrate what you're believing for. But I want you to define it. So this is one of our staff members. They typed out every single thing. So it's not just a picture. It's describing what you're believing for and slapping a scripture on it. Because how many know that the word became flesh? And so you start confessing the word of God. And let me tell you something, that, that dream, that vision will come to pass. And God wants us to dream it. And so what we're doing is on Wednesday night, and I've, I've heard a lot of people already started their vision boards. And I know that the 31st, we wanted to leave it to you and your family hang out. Because last year we threw a New Year's party. This year I said, let's let the people enjoy their family. But tonight at 5 p.m., we're having our, our New Year's life party. And what we're doing is we're asking everybody who did their vision board. And don't worry. If you didn't make me, you're like, oh, my God, I missed Wednesday. That's okay. Don't worry about it. You can leave after service. Go to Walmart. Go to Target. Go to Michael's. Get a poster board and start slapping some things, 10 things that you want to accomplish in 2019. And then take a picture of it and then come back tonight. Because tonight, I really believe how we exit is how we enter. And we're going to be praying over every single one of our vision boards and we're going to believe God that he's going to bring every single thing to pass and so I encourage you come back tonight you don't want to miss it now let me prep you with this message are you ready so everybody say this with me it's not the movement of the clock it's the movement of my mind God wants to move the way you think in 2019 so that we can accomplish some things that look impossible to you but are possible with God. But that takes a new mind, a new perspective, a new vision, a new attitude. It takes a new person. You can't have a new year with an old you. You need a new you for a new experience. And God wants to do that. Here's what Proverbs 29, 18 says. Look at this. It says, where there is no vision, the people what? I don't think there's anything more clear than when you have no vision, you die. You die. You die how? Do I die physically? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've seen where, you know, uh, uh, couples that have been married forever and the spouse dies and the other one ends up dying, you know, weeks if not months later. There's no vision to live. And so he says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no revelation. The King James Version says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Everybody say cast off. We're going to talk about this today. I want you to grab your hand and go like this. Go like this. They cast off. When you don't have a revelation from God, we will always cast off restraint. What does that mean? That simply means that if you don't know what to do, then you will do nothing. When you have no um, guidance or revelation from God, what you end up doing is you will go ahead and default to baser, if not sinful, 
lifestyles. Why? God gives us vision so that we can stay grounded, so that we can stay focused, so that we can progress, so that we can grow, so that we can see blessings. God gives vision in order for us not to be distracted with sin, not to be distracted with lies, not to be distracted with... He wants us to have vision in 2019. And you know what? I really believe that the prophetic word from God, what he's doing in this time, um, you know what 19 means? 2019, it means faith. 2019 is going to be the year of my greatest faith in Jesus' name. And you know what 2020 means? Vision. So you better have some great faith in 2019 because 2020 is coming and big things are going to take place. That's exciting. I'm looking forward. My, all my goals are pointing to 2020. There's some amazing things that are going to happen. And so when people have no divine guidance, you know what ends up happening? And you all know it. We all know this. When you have no divine guidance, people tend to rebel against God's will for their life. And they end up committing to their own ways. When you don't have divine revelation, when you don't have divine guidance, you start doing your thing. And your thing turns into swamp thing. And it smells. Does it not? Yes or no? We get weird. You know, you start out strong and we just kind of, we kind of lose focus. So when the vision is clear, the results will appear. When the vision is clear, the results will appear. I mean, Katrina is a perfect example. And setting goals is the first step to turning the invisible realm into the visible realm. Come on, how many are ready for that? Amen. All right. So let's talk about Moses because on Wednesday I talked about Abraham. Let's just go ahead and talk about Moses. Um, God always spoke to people in the Bible, and when he spoke to them, he always uh, painted a picture for them, and, and he had to do that because he understand that God created us to be uh, people with an imagination. Uh, for example, like, watch, let me pick this up real quick. Okay, I got an apple that I just picked off the floor. Y'all see it? What color is it? I don't, I don't have an apple. It just shows you how creative we are. God created us to be people of imagination. And so God would paint a picture for them. And then this picture would then be the very thing that they would hold on to. You know, Abraham, he told them, look, at, look up at the stars, see if you can count them. Boom. Look at the, at the ground, see if you can count the, sound of, the, the, sand of, uh, the grain of sand. Boom. What was he doing to them? He knew that every single day he walked in the day in the desert, so he saw sand. And every night he saw the stars. So guess what? Every day vision was before him. Let's talk about Moses now. Moses, Moses failed. We know that Moses is the, he's the prince of Egypt, right? And he's, he's in position and he's doing great things, but then he failed. He kills an Egyptian by accident because he was standing up for one of the Israelites. Something was happening on, on the inside of him and he stood up for somebody that he saw was being mistreated. And so he kills the guy and then he runs for his life. Where does he run to? The desert. God bless that one person that knows the Bible. All right. Awesome. Yay. Where does he run to? The desert. He runs into the wilderness. And so for 40 years, just stay with me because this is all going to make sense. Because some of us have been stuck in a place for years. And so for 40 years, you have Moses who is in this wilderness. He's in this desert. And you know what he ends up doing? He camouflages the call of his life with a shepherd's clothing and a stick. He camouflages it. He's running from his call. He's running from his divine purpose. He's running, running, running. And now he's in the desert. And we know the story. He comes before the presence of God through the burning bush. And how many know that? Uh, I'm sure none of us here will probably ever see a burning bush. But guess what? Open your Bible and there's your burning bush. God will speak to you. And so the burning bush is burning. And, and, and Moses is freaked out because he's like, oh, my God, what is this? What does all this mean? And God starts speaking to him. And the story goes like this. I want you to go with me to Exodus chapter 4. And mind you, by this time, Moses is 80 years old. So for 40 years, he had 40 New Year's. And nothing changed. Maybe you've been doing life and for the last year or five years, nothing has changed with you. 
Maybe you still have the same attitude, the same perspective. Maybe you're still mad at God. Maybe you're still mad at your family. Maybe you still can't forgive. Maybe it's the same old, I don't know what, where you're stuck, but let me tell you something. I believe that God put the story of Moses for a reason for every single one of us to look at it and say, you know what? I don't want to be stuck like Moses for 40 years. He's now 80 years old, and God is speaking to him. Look at... Um, Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, it says this. It says, Moses answered, so he's responding to God's call. He says, what if the elders of Israel won't believe me? Because you know what God said, I want you, Moses, to go to Egypt, and you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. He said, well, what if the elders don't believe me? What if all those righteous people just, they don't accept me? And look what he says. What if they won't listen to me? Suppose they say the Lord didn't appear to you. Then what should I do? And the Lord said to him, what do you have in your hand? Fingers? He's like, no, Goofy, what's in your hand? A stick? He said, what do you have in your hand? He says, I have a walking stick, he said. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And so think about this. So he has a stick. And notice, God, God was expecting him to apply something. It wasn't just, you know, what's in your hand. God said, okay, take what's in your hand, and I want you to what? Throw it. I want you to what? Cast it down. I want you to throw it. So he threw the stick to the ground, and it turned into a what? Snake. That's probably where he got his stutter from, huh? Because he got freaked out. He's like, oh, my God. Look, and he, he did what? He what? He ran away from it. Let me tell you something. Your vision board should, your first, your first experience should be, I'm running away from it. Notice this. Moses was, he was so qualified to run. I mean, he had been running for 40 years. So the first time that God has him throw down his, his stick, it turns into a snake. The power of God, the, the, the miraculous of God shows up. The first thing he did was run. When you start getting a vision from God, you're going to feel like you need to run from that sucker. Most of us, when God speaks something to us that's bigger than us, that doesn't make sense to us because Moses felt inadequate, he felt unqualified, he failed, and now he's in the desert for 40 years, and then now God shows up, and he tells him, what's in your hand? He says, a stick. He says, throw the stick. The snake shows up. What is the first thing you do? He runs for his life. Maybe you've been running for your life. Maybe you haven't accepted that God wants to do something unique and special in your life. Maybe there's something that's been holding you back from becoming the person, the woman, the man that God is calling you to be. Maybe there's something that keeps instilling fear in you that is keeping you from stepping into that new career, that new business. Come on, maybe there's something that's holding you back from inviting new relationships, new friendships into your life. People that are going to catapult you. People that are going to push you. People that are going to pray with you. People that will pray for you. Maybe there's something that just keeps holding you back and you've been running year after year after year and there's a dream that has been inside of you for way too long and all you do is you maybe think about it here and there or you talk about it here and there but eventually you forgot about it and God's saying let's get that thing back and so it says that he threw the snake down and of course he ran away from it makes sense Moses the runner verse 4 then the Lord said to Moses reach your hand out take the snake by the tail so he reached out and he grabbed the snake and he turned it back into a walking stick in his hand. Now, I know you look at this stick, you're like, yeah, whatever, stupid stick, right? But if I came out today and came out with a snake, like, whoo, man, you'd be like, dang, that's a saint Wow, we've got to go to church more often, right? You'd be like, whoa, wow, how does he do that? That's the point. God is just looking for someone who can be an ordinary, common Nothing special, nothing unique. God's not looking for smarts. God's not looking for, for looks. God's not looking for anything 
but for someone who is willing to be available in the hand of God. And let me tell you something. God can take an ordinary stick like you and me, and you put his super on your naturalness, and he starts doing supernatural things in our life. Are you here today? That's what God wants to do with some people. And so look at this. And so um, he turned that sucker back into a stick. And he's probably tripping on like, wow. And the Lord said, and when they see this sign. So he tells them, don't worry about it, Moses. And when they see this, when they see that vision that you put up, when they see that thing you're believing for, when they see that you received my word, look what happens. He says, they will believe that I appeared to you. I am the Lord, the God of their fathers. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob right I love this Moses is now receiving the call he's finally not running anymore and 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 you know what's interesting when you think about the burning bush why did God tell him take off your shoes because he was a runner he said, take off your shoes, Moses. You're not going to run this time. And I really believe that God is speaking to some people today saying, take off your shoes. You ain't running for me anymore. You're going to start running to me. You're going to start believing me. You're going to start trusting me. And you know why? Because at the end of this verse, after he chooses Moses being a stick, a simple, ordinary stick, he reminds him of who God is. He said, I am that I am. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Abraham. He is God and he reminds you that anything that you're going to believe him for, that he is the one that's going to be the source in order for you to accomplish it. I'm really praying that Elevate Church rises in amazing extreme ways in 2019. And when I say Elevate Church, I mean you. Man, that there will be the most incredible, amazing breakthroughs that you would finally stop running from that dream that's in your heart. I know there's people here that are probably in their 60s, 70s. Man, you know there was something inside of you that you were passionate about, but life does what it does. It hits you with stuff, and you get distracted, and later on you think, well, maybe it wasn't God. Well, maybe it was God. And you're not too old. If God can pick out a Moses at the age of 80, God can pick you out at the age of 60, 70, 80, and still breathe life on you. So don't ever say, I'm too old or I'm too young. You're never too old, never too young with God. It's time to go ahead and just decide, God, I'm your stick in your hand, right? That's all you need is God's presence on your life and just imagine what you can accomplish. Come on, just, just, just close your eyes for a minute and just say, Heavenly Father, I am your stick in your hand. Do what you wish in Jesus' name. Amen. So notice, notice God didn't ask Moses, What's in your head? See, because God wasn't dependent on how smart Moses was. See, because you know what? God knows that he gave us a brain and we can develop our intelligence. But God did not want to use man's intelligence. God wanted to use his super on someone's natural abilities, which Moses at this point really didn't have any. God didn't say, hey, Moses, what's in your speech? Because here's the reality. In Hebrews 11, uh, when you read the heroes of faith, it says that Moses was an eloquent communicator. Okay, yes, he had a stuttering speech, but he was an eloquent communicator. God was not depending on how eloquent Moses spoke. All God wanted was, will you be my stick? That's all I'm asking for. Will you trust me? Will you believe me with what I want to do in your life? And of course, we see that God finally gets a hold of Moses, and Moses is now going and, 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 and obeying God, and he's moving forward, and, and he's not running anymore, and that's wonderful and everything. But uh, you take the story of Moses. So Moses, when you think about the, the, the children of Israel, when they were stuck at the Red Sea, if it wasn't for that stick, I just want you to see this. If it wasn't for that stick, there is no way that those Red Seas would be able to be parted with it. If it wasn't for some sticks, remember when they were in the journey with Moses and the children of Israel were grumbling and complaining and they're like, dang, why'd you bring us out here? We're thirsty. And they get to, to the waters of Marah. 
And they're right there. And the waters were bitter and spoiled and smelly and nasty. And God gives Moses the guidance. He says, Moses, grab some sticks and throw it into the water. And the moment Moses took the word from the Lord, it says that the water turned sweet. It was like sweet tea. And they all started consuming. You see, you can never despise these, these little stick moments of our life because God will use it. Look at what... Um, Psalms 127, 1 through verse 2 says, it says, if the Lord doesn't build a house, the work of the builders is what? Useless. This is now, Solomon wrote this. Solomon in all his wisdom and all his riches, okay? Richest man in the world ever, and there's never been one like, when, like him. He says, if the Lord doesn't build a house, the work of the builders is useless. If the Lord doesn't watch over a city, it's useless. For those on guard duty to stand watch over, it says it's useless for you to work from early morning until late at night just to get food to eat. God provides for those he loves even while they sleep. Okay, you can read this like, Phew. Well, God doesn't want me to dream. God doesn't want me to build. No, it's not what Solomon was saying. He was saying, hey, listen, be dreamers, be visionaries, be builders. But don't you dare think to take God out of the equation. Because the moment you take God out of your building of any dream, any business, any family, you're in trouble. And we see that over and over again. In this world, we take God out of the picture and all hell comes in to come to steal, kill, destroy. So Solomon is saying, hey, listen, guys. Be builders, but don't be that kind of builder that starts doing everything on your own because anything you do, what will end up happening is you will end up living a normal, basic life where you're just surviving to feed yourself, to pay the bills, to go on vacation, to pay your car payment, to pay your mortgage. And God's saying, I have created you. I have called you to something greater than just eating. Unless the Lord builds that house. Those who labor, labor in vain. We've got to invite God in 2019. Everybody say, put God first. You've got to put God first in 2019. You know, it's like, it's like we get excited. Yeah, I'm going to put God first. And it's like the gym, right? We say, okay, I'm going to work out. Yeah, that works out for about two weeks. Then we forget it. Same thing goes with God. We get passionate about, you know, God for a season. But have you noticed that it's so easy for people to lose fire with God? It's so easy for people to lose that excitement, that enthusiasm, that zeal for God. You know, people start off real strong, and then they, why, why do they get all weak? You know why? Because they lose vision. And when you have no vision, the temptation is always going to come and give you something else. And that temptation will keep you distracted for as long as you and I let it. And it's time to change that in 2019. I love this. Dang, I mean, just think about this. I'm going to rabbit trail real quick. Where did Moses get the, the stick from? Where did that stick come from? This isn't a trick question. Where did this, where'd this stick come from? I'm sorry? From a tree? Okay, it was originated from a tree. Where did he find it at? In the desert, in the wilderness. Think about this for a second. So he finds the stick in the wilderness. I'm amazed at how many people have the attitude of, I can't wait for 20. I am so sick of 20. I just, I hate 2018. Just get me into 2019 and all will be well. And people are so ticked off at 2018 and I despise 2018 and I can't, I'm just so over 2018. Why? Because many times we associate our wilderness experiences as something that is, that is, that is, not worth going through, but how many know that God doesn't just want you to go through these wilderness experiences? He wants you to grow through wilderness experiences. Amen? And so maybe you've had a challenging, difficult, heartbreaking 2018, and you may be asking yourself, how could God even allow me, his daughter, or his son to experience all this pain and suffering? Let me tell you, God will allow it, but God will use it. God will never waste anything that you have experienced in your lifetime. God will use it for something greater. Think about it. Where did Moses find his stick? In his wilderness. When he was running from God, when he was rebelling 
running from God, when he was not trusting God, where he was not connecting with God. And guess what? Right there, he finds that stick. You see, I'll tell you one thing Moses had going for him. He had experience going for him. Because now he has a stick of an experience of a dry wilderness desert experience and he has some authority and some dominion to talk about how do you get through your wilderness experiences you have experienced some things in 2018 that now you can say i have learned more compassion for sick people i have learned that with god's help he will provide when you tithe when you give when you help god and you learn from those horrible experiences because if not you'll just be trapped for 40 years just talking about all the pain all the suffering and let me tell you something where is that getting you so i'm praying that that we would have the spirit maybe some of you are still stuck in 2016 maybe some of you are still stuck in 2014 maybe some of you are still stuck in 1999 still got the same hairdo god's saying come on Listen, I won't waste your experiences. I won't waste your pain. He says, I'll use it what the enemy meant for harm in your life. God's saying, I will use it for something good. Now Moses has some experience of the wilderness, and it gave him some, some strength and some swag to go and talk to Pharaoh now. So don't think, why would God allow this? Thank God, I hope you use this sooner than later. But, it, but it, makes, it takes a decision. It takes a renewing of the mind. It takes a new perspective. It takes a new way of viewing your, your circumstance. It makes you make a decision that I'm done with this. I, listen, I can, I will, the end. Enough. We've been so good at making excuses. We got to stop the excuses. It's easier to make an excuse because there's no effort to it. But when you decide, I'm going to go for it, man, God will use it for something special. And he'll give you some authority. Let me tell you something. I don't regret any of the challenges and circumstances I've been through. And I've been through some heavy ones, even to the, at the point of death. I don't. I, I thank God for it. You know why? Because it has taught me so much compassion for sick people. I, I'm like, thank you, Father, that even though it was painful, hurtful, even though I lost a year of my life, man, I count it all. I'm like, thank you, God, because I learned so much out of that experience, so much. And I got some authority when it comes to sickness and disease. I know how to cast sickness and disease out of people's lives. I know how to walk into hospitals and not be intimidated by machines and doctors that are educated and have facts, and they start drawing it down. And I just tell them, in the name of Jesus, God is going to change this situation. God is going to raise this person who's in a coma from the dead. When you've, when you've experienced God, let me tell you something. There is no person on this planet that can change your mind when you've already had an encounter with God. You know, you can argue theology, but you can't argue my story. I, I know what I've experienced in this life, and so do you. And God wants to use that experience for something greater. So think about this. Let's keep going quickly. Are you all bored yet? Good. So Moses accepts the call. Is it warm in here? Or am I just warm? I'm just hot. It's warm. Okay, someone, please, let's get some air up in this place because people are falling asleep here. No, they're not. So Moses... Lord, this volume, please. So Moses um, is at this place where he's going now to Pharaoh. We're going to forward it real quick. He's going to Pharaoh. And now he's in front of Pharaoh and he tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh looks at him, dude, what are you doing here? It's kind of like you when you do that vision board, people are going to be like, are you crazy? <laughs> what the heck are you thinking, man? What is that? You can't do that. Pharaoh was looking at him like, where have you been, man? Are, are you kidding? Get out of here. Get, you know, shoe fly. Don't bother me. And, and you know what? Moses, uh, I really believe that he was walking with some swag. You know why? Because have you ever had to go take a test and you studied hard for it? And you walked into that room, you're like, I got this. I'm going to ace this. I have studied. I have prepared. I have stayed up late. It's going to be amazing. And you walk in, you're like, bring it. Anyone ever felt that way? Good. And you take it, boom. But have you ever walked into a test, whether it was a real estate test or whether it was a DMV test or whether it's some type of licensing test, and you walk in and you feel so unprepared? 
And you're that person that says, oh, God, please, please, Lord, if you just get me out of this mess, I'll serve you the rest of my life, right? Some of you can relate to that prayer, right? Like, I'll be good forever and ever and ever. And uh, then we're not. But anyways, and, and so, so think about this. Moses, man, God said, and when they, because Moses said, show me a sign. And God says, throw the stick, snakey snake, right? And God said, and when they see this sign, they'll believe you. So Moses shows up, and he's like, what's up? Let my people go. That's what God said. Let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, you crazy. He starts calling out his magicians. The Bible not only calls them magicians, but if you look at the original translation of magicians, is he called out the trickeries. What's a trickery? Listen, a magician can only deceive you. A magician can only make you think that you're seeing something that's not. A magician will lie to you about something that they're creating to make you believe the lie. And so he calls out his trickery. He calls out his magicians, his deceivers. And you know what happens? Uh, Pharaoh's like, <laughs> do you see that? Do that too. And they come and they, they grab their like stick. Everybody say like stick, not a stick. They grabbed a like stick and Kah! and sure enough, there's a shh, a snake. And Moses is like, how many know at this moment, Moses like, God, what the heck? What in the, you said they would believe. You didn't tell me that they can also do these, these amazing supernatural miracles. But how many know that there's only so much, this speaks to us. This is a lesson. I really believe that what God was showing us through these verses was that you and I can deceive ourselves and think that everything that you and I are creating on this earth, that sometimes we can be deceived that we're doing it for God, but you're really just doing it for you. We can twist the idea that I am serving God's will, but we're really serving our will. It's not my will, let, let your will be done, not my will. It's not that. It's more of a facade that we think. And God's saying, hey, listen, there's a difference between natural and and supernatural and so why do i say this i say this because of this if you study the scriptures thoroughly and i've i've read a few uh uh, uh, uh things that that uh, uh what do you call those these professors that study the verses and 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 all of them have come up with the same conclusion and it's legit because you have to have an explanation for this word well the bible explains that these magicians what they did was this because they were magicians, they would have to create something that would make people believe something that was not. So what they did with this whole thing with their snake, it was simply this, this, this long piece that, that was something that encompassed. It wasn't a stick, but it looked like a stick. And what they would do is they would put the snake inside that thing that they built, that they created. And so any time that you would hit that on the ground, that encompassing thing that held that snake it would break and then the snake would come out and so it was magic it was deceiving and so just think but Moses had no idea Moses is thinking you got to be kidding me God you you left me hanging man you made us look bad and so what happens is is as you read the rest of the story and I don't have time to read it the Bible says that once that happened and all of Israel was watching. All of Egypt was seeing the showdown go down, literally. So when they saw Moses and the snake, people were like, yes, hope again. But then when they saw Pharaoh do what he did, they lost hope. And how many of us as believers, you start off with God with hope, and then something happens, and you lose hope again. But God always brings it back. Because the Bible says... And when, and when the magicians had their snake flowing on the ground, it says, and God's snake and Moses' snake ate the snake of Pharaoh. And you know what God's saying? God's saying, listen, when you trust me, when you're a stick in my hand, I will make sure that I will eat the deception, the lies, the fears, the doubts, whatever it is you're dealing with. God's saying, I will eat that thing up for breakfast but you got to be in God's hand you have to be in God's hand it can't just be keep doing church the same way keep being a Christian the same way 
It's got to, something's got to change. There's got to be more zeal, more passion. We have to stop being so afraid that when you're going for God all in and something happens that you don't just start defaulting back to your old attitude. That you start questioning God and start doubting that. Huh? Listen, I'm sure that every single person in here has had an experience with God where God met you when you were at your lowest point, when something you needed him to do, you felt like, man, this is the end. But then you had that little mustard seed of faith, and you're like, God, I believe you. I'm trusting you. And then God shows up. That's what we need back in the church. We need that back. So just imagine how Moses felt after that. God ate up the lies. God ate up the deception. God ate it all up. And I'll tell you, Pharaoh had no choice after a bunch of plagues to let his people go. I'm believing that your vision board is going to keep you stirred in all 2019. And you're, gonna, you're not going to write things like that are simple and easy for you. You're going to write things that are are going to need God's super in your natural. You're going to have to look at that boy and say, how is that impossible? I just can't see it. I, I love all these things that Felicia put for her personal life. You know, she put right here, this is my happy place. Because you know what? More and more people struggle with this thing called prayer. More and more. It's so simple, but yet so powerful. Why do I struggle with that? Because if you were a man or woman of prayer, You'd be different. And Satan is keeping you from change. So she said, this will be my happy place in 2019. Not my house. Nothing wrong with the house. Get the biggest house you can. Not my car. Nothing wrong with the car. Get the nicest car you want. It's not my toys, the boat, the motorcycle, the vacations. No, my joy is found in the Lord. It's in Jesus. He's my happiness. He's my joy. Everything else is the added blessing. That, that changes. Instead of always just talking about what's not happening, who you are, it just, that, gets, that gets old. Man, Moses got old in the desert. God was like, all right, boy, you want to do something or not? You want to make some changes or what? It wasn't a moving of the clock. It was a moving of the mind. It's time to move. It's time to change. I love this. Can I leave you with one last thought? Let's just close it there. Last thought. Do you realize that that the greatest miracle wasn't turning a stick into a snake? That wasn't even it. I believe that the greatest miracle in the story was when the snake turned back into the stick. Why? Because the stick symbolizes your small beginnings. Your stick symbolizes humility. See, because before God, it was just a stick. But after God came into the picture, it was a powerful stick, a life-changing stick, a supernatural stick. But it's not, it's not about just asking God for platforms and for influence and for money. And, you know, because I've seen over and over in the years of ministry, I've been in this for 22 years, and I've seen people that were sticks and they started off humble. But it's amazing how they started off so humble and, and, and they were struggling and then you know, God, God got a hold of them and they started trusting God and they started tithing and giving and believing and the blessings of God were like, bam, bam, bam. But all of a sudden, they got so blessed and, and then they just started forgetting the humility and, and the humbleness of that stick when God got a hold of you and you start drawing away people in the church, in this church, in every church in Santa Clarita today. There are people who, when they first were saved, they had an encounter with God and it was special and it was 
beautiful, and you couldn't wait to share the gospel with people. You couldn't, sh- couldn't wait to share how God wants to bring hope to their family, hope to their life. But all of a sudden, we let life get the best of us. And now there's just no passion, no excitement, no zeal for God. Now it's a hit or miss. I go when I feel like, like it, or I go when I'm in trouble. I, I, it's amazing how we can be so disconnected so easily distracted because where there is no vision my people perish i'll never forget the day i came to work in ministry it was so humbling leaving a six-digit figure of income to go into ministry man but i'll never forget when i was given the title church janitor that was my title i started as the janitor from executive you know what God does God will come in points in your life and he will test your humility but I'll never forget when they gave me the position as the church janitor and they handed those keys to me I was like wow God you really think of me like that you trust me with your house I got the keys to the front door that was like for me it was like I got the keys to a Maserati Like, I just felt like, wow. And, of course, the house of God is way more than that. But I'm like, wow. And I remember cleaning the bathrooms with a toothbrush. Why? Because I was like, my father's house has to look amazing. It has to look clean. It has to look awesome. Why? When people come, I want them to have the awe of God. I want them to experience the Jesus I experienced. How many of us started off with that attitude about God's house and little by little there is almost a disrespect or a dishonor or kind of treat the church like an afterthought or you treat God like an afterthought and he's not first anymore. God's saying, I need my sticks back. I need my sticks back. I need humility back in the house. I need humility. I need men and women who love me, not for what I do for them, but for for who I am to them. Humility. Not how much God can give me, but how much I love him. And it's from that foundation, it's from that place that God's grace comes upon you. We got to get humility back in the house. Because out of humility is where great power comes. Think of it. Jesus came in the form of man and humbled himself unto death. The greatest power came humbly like a man. Stand to your feet. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.